Okay, friends, uh, uh, it's 8.30 p.m. in the evening uh, in India. So uh, it's a special day, uh, it's very first day of uh, 2022. So I would like to, uh, you know, the wish you a very happy new year 2022. And, uh, you know, the entire world is uh, celebrating the very first day. But we people are sitting in front of the computer terminals to enrich our understanding of, you know, the, in the field of the, the, the manufacturing. And, uh, you know, the, in this regard, in a lighter note, I, I recall the, uh, you know, the very famous quote of, uh, uh, you know, of a Bengali writer. And uh, Sibram Chakravati, he said that after a good many years of struggle and strong struggle and deep, uh, you know, the investigation, I came to a conclusion that there is no point of celebrating the new year. Because whenever a new year comes up, it, didn't, it, it doesn't last more than a year. So let us, uh, uh, you know, the... Go ahead with our uh, the mega webinar series. Today is the 43rd week, 43rd Saturday, 1st of January 2022. And we are very fortunate to have George Vanderwood. You know, the George Vanderwood, who is the president of the Vanderwood Consulting and a consultant of stewards, who is also a graduate of Drexel University and Lehigh University with a background in metallurgy and material science. And he has got 29 years of experience in the U.S. steel industry with Bethlehem Steel, Carpenter Technology, and 13 years with Gwela Limited. A past president of the International Metallographic Society and the first chairman of ASTM committee, George was the USA representative to ISO on metallography for 25 years. He has six patents. 447 publications, including Metallography Principles and Practice, which is a publication of Mangroil, Principles of Metallography, and Gueller's Guide to Materials Preparation. He served as a trustee for ASM International and was the editor of ASM Handbook, Metallography, and Microstructures. He was a member of the editorial board of Materials Characterization, an associate ed editor and is presently on the editorial boards of practice metallography, metallography, microstructure and analysis, and image analysis and stereology, and the International Journal of Microstructures and Materials Properties. George has taught 87 ASM Metals Engineering Institutes courses from 1977 to 2017 and has given 459 lectures in 42 countries. Created eight ASTM standards. He's the fellow of ASMI, ASTM, and IFS, IFHDAC. He was named as the distinguished life member of Alpha Sigma Mu Honorary Society and is an honorary member of the Polish Society of Stereology. ASMI named George a distinguished life member in 2020. Drexel University presented George with the Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2005 and the Service to the Profession Award in 2016. He received 36 awards for his microscopy, microscopy work, including, including Jacket Lucas Grand Prize and the Dubos Krause Award of the International Metallographic Contest. So this is a very brief bio sketch of you know the uh, George Vanderbilt, and we are very fortunate. Our center of excellence, which is the industry focused R and D center at IIT Kharagpur, we are we are very fortunate to uh, you know the had George presence uh, in sometime in 2018, and we conducted a course on uh, metallography where a large number of you know the candidates participated and. Uh, they were from the different sectors, like the faculty members from our own institutes, doctoral scholars, industry people, industry, both MSMEs and the, you know, large sectors. And everybody enjoyed that, you know, the presence of George at IIT Kharagpur at that time. So we are very fortunate once again to have George with us today. 
on the very first day of 2020, 22, to listen to his, you know, the, the understanding about uh, uh, his thoughts on the metallography of the welding process. George, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, should I hit share? To load my presentation? Yeah, I I think you are you are given an access, so you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, just come here. Looks like it's gonna work. Yeah, it's it's working. So you can you can select your first slide and then go to the presentation mode. Okay. Uh, by the way, I, I am not uh, consulting uh, these days for brewers. Uh, I didn't go back to doing that in 2019 because of, I didn't want to fly out to, uh, from Chicago to Cleveland all the time. That'd be too painful. Especially with the you know the virus and underway, uh, so I uh, increase this to, to the whole screen. Uh, have you increased this to full screen? What's that? Have you increased the yeah yeah now it's okay yeah. Right, good. Well, today we're going to talk about welding and weld microstructures. And I am a consultant now for Bueller Limited for since last uh, November uh, 2019, and uh, I do webinars for them every month. A lot of fun. So, uh, is it possible to to move the screen up higher because it's blocking my view of the of the words? And we move this. Uh, yeah, yeah, good. yeah, we are the second uh, the slide uh, the type with the title "Understanding the Welding Process and Its Effect on Structure." Good, that helps me read read more. <laughs> so, <clears throat> this is our first slide. You know, welding is a pretty complex process. It's got a lot of different pr procedures, like fusion welding, shielded metal arc, submerged arc, gas metal arc. Gas tungsten arc, plasma arc, electro slag and electro gas, oxy fuel gas, electron beam, laser beam, stud, percussion, and thermite. And then there's resistant welding uh, processes. Uh, spot welding is quite common with sheet steel, seam, projection, and flash welding. And then solid state welding processes, uh, forging, uh, forge welding, deformation welding, diffusion, bonding. Explosive bonding, friction, friction stir bonding, ultrasonic upset. And then in brazing, of course, uh, it's much simpler. It's furnace brazing, torch, and induction. Now, um, here's some uh, definitions for terminology when it comes to examining the weld microstructures. Uh, you can see over here, here's a weld in between two pieces of plate steel or sheet steel, depending on the you know thickness. And uh, we've got the weld metal in the center. And if there's a fusion zone here. And uh, there's, this is a weld junction uh, right here and over here. And uh, <clears throat> we have a heat affected zone and here and then the base metal. And this would be the weld root on a weld uh, created in that shape. Over here on the right, this is another type. This would be a, a vertical piece welded to a horizontal piece of steel. And <clears throat> again, uh, we have the weld zone here. This is as before. <clears throat> and the weld metals here. And you can see that if we draw a line straight down here and go to the fusion line, you can measure the depth of, of the fusion penetration. And of course, you can measure the depth of the heat affected zone as well. And these are pretty common uh, things to do. 
Now, when we're working with um, cheek steels in particular, you know, a lot of the steels that are welded are low alloy because it's much simpler than high alloy steels. And uh, you can see here, uh, here's the iron carbon phase diagram. That's carbon content going this way from zero over here. And this would be the uh, all, al all ferrate or alpha phase. And we have a, a mixture in here of ferrite and cementite as the carbon increases. And we have a two phase mixture here of austenite and ferrite and so forth. And uh, here's the uh, temperature in the weld. And you can see that it's uh, going across uh, that the microstructure in here is going to be affected uh, following the phase diagram, except that. Phase diagram is an equilibrium diagram, and welding is not really an equilibrium type process. And but this is a heat in these different temperatures and areas, but it uh, it helps you understand what's going on. Um, this is an example of the macro to micro correlation that we deal with. This schematic shows the weld, the heat affected zone, and the base metal microstructure relative to the weld. Here's the weld metal, and the heat affected zone is on the side here. And this would be the fusion line right here, coming down here. So this area right here is shown down here as the microstructure. And uh, this is the weld metal, and it's acicular looking. And then we have the fusion line and the uh, grain structure is coarsest along the fusion line because it has the highest temperature in the base metal. And as you go inward, it goes into the normal original grain size and microstructure. But this area is seeing the carbon go into solution into all austenite. And then on cooling, we're getting uh, different uh, perlites in a carbon steel. And of course, in, if it's got some alloy content, we can get bainite and martensite in there. Now, we do have uh, problems with welding and creating defects. And this is a diagram that I found a long, long time ago uh, showing two views of weld metal and different types of, of cracks in there. Like this right here is a, often called a crater crack or face crack or well metal crack. You know, well metal crack is not very uh, definitive terminology, but it's okay. Uh, down here, we can see we've got uh, four different possible terms for that crack. Uh, face, face crack, longitudinal crack, uh, throat crack, and well metal crack again. And then down here, this is in the base metal, and there's only one there, lamellar tear. So, you know, this this is a good diagram to to use if you're trying to describe to other people uh, the nature of the crack that you're looking at. It'll help them understand what you're talking about better. Now let's look at macrostructure of weldments. This is a, a microstructure of three gas metal arc welds in structural steel with a heat input of 45 kilojoules per inch. The atmospheres uh, were 100% CO2 on the left and over here. And then we've got argon plus 25% CO2. And over here, we got argon with 2% CO, uh, oxygen, not CO2. And uh, macro, this is ground, uh, and macro etched with 10% uh, nitric acid and water, which is pretty commonly used in, in macro etching many steels. And you can see that the uh, gas being used in a gas metal arc weld uh, does affect the shape and the penetration of the weld. And even the angles here at the surface, you can see this has a little recess. Uh, and that, whereas the, this one doesn't, but uh, over here, there's a lip, a lip out here over a metal on top, uh, which you don't see in the other two, other two. And the heat affected zone goes deeper 
So uh, these, these are the kind of differences you can affect. Just see, here's a, a difference in heat input now. Uh, this same submerged dark weld, structural steel, the heat inputs were 90 on the left, 60 and 30 kilojoules per inch from left to right. And you can see the difference in the size of the, of the weld metal and the penetration depth. Again, this was that's with 10% nitric water. And uh, increase in the heat input is increasing the nugget size. This is much bigger, of course. The depth of penetration, the size of the heat affected zone, and of course, it can affect the microstructure as well. Now, here we're gonna look at the surface of uh, uh, bead, uh, three beads of uh, MIG metal inert gas fusion wells in an ASTM plate steel, ASTM A517, using three different heat inputs. Uh, the weld direction is from the bottom to the, uh, to the or excuse me, from the top to the bottom. And so the, the last area to, to solidify here has crater defects in it. Not uncommon. Now here's a side, a view through these welds um, in that same, the same samples you just saw there. And we're etching this with 10% ammonium persulfate in water. And you can see the macrostructure, uh, very uh, interesting. This of course is the smallest because it has the, the, it was the smallest well with the least uh, uh, amount of uh, heat input. And this is the largest because it had the largest amount of heat input. And the heat affected zone is much different here than in the other two. And the, the uh, penetration uh, uh, of the weld uh, in the center is deeper, just like this one. But this one seems to have a, a greater depth of penetration in the center. So that's the kind of differences you're going to see as uh, you change the heat input. Now, here's a, a well, well, well a sample of beryllium uh, shown in macrostructure. Uh, it's as polished uh, and, and uh, <clears throat> viewed in polarized light, but it's not etched. And uh, Dick Bukite gave me this uh, micrograph. He is an old friend of mine, but unfortunately no longer alive, but uh, a really good guy, and this is showing the the, the weld uh, nugget up here on the top, the, and the, the surface is not flat. You can see, uh, here's the surface on the left side versus the right side, and down here you can see there's a mismatch in the uh, connection be between the two pieces, and you got the, a nugget down here. As, as well, but it's a nice microstructure, and you know you can do this with beryllium because it's it's not uh, a, a body center face center cubic. Here's a flash butt weld in commercial purity titanium. Uh, again, this is a picture that of Dick Bukai, and you can see uh, this is a flash weld, and they're jamming these two pieces together in a came at an angle between the two pieces. And you can see that the, the deformation is vast in the center here, of course. And then metal, molten metal is squeezing out on top and bottom and then solidifying. So if you're going to use something like this in service, you're going to have to remove this uh, junk before you put it in service. But uh, this was etched with the uh, reagent of aqueous 1.5% percent HF, 15% nitric. And here's a weld in Zircaloy 4 uh, that's been ground and polished. And this is the, the uh, uh, end of the weld over here. And uh, this is etched with pickle simers uh, reagent, which you can find in the literature. And the, the microstructure varies a good bit. And Alan Lockley gave me this uh, micrograph a number of years ago. He works a lot with uh, zirconium alloys. Now, we, we're, there are times when we need to measure the weld macrostructure. 
so we can compare different processes. And Stewart's has a, a machine called the welding expert that you can get to measure the geometry of your weldments. And, and it does work nicely. And here's uh, some examples of using that system, measuring the weld geometry. Here's a vertical plate welded to this horizontal one. And you can see that this edge is not perfectly flat. <clears throat> and we can measure, here's the effusion line going through here. And we can measure this depth uh, from here to here, 6.7 millimeters throat depth. And you can, the heat affected zone is not as easy to see here as it is over here. But, uh, and the heat affected zone in, in the vertical uh, plate looks a good bit different than the bottom one. So here you're seeing a lot of grinding marks. And, uh, but this is the heat affected zone in this region and the base metals over here. Here's another example, same welds, depth of penetration into the horizontal plate is 42% of the plate thickness. Plate was seven millimeters thick, which you can measure with that system. And the depth of to the base of the weld is three millimeters. So that is 42% of the thickness. And up here we can measure the uh, depth of penetration on the vertical uh, piece of metal. And uh, that's only about 13%. We got uh, this depth from the surface to over here is 5.4 millimeters, but the depth of the weld penetration uh, is only about 0.7 millimeters. So it's much less on the vertical plate. And here we can measure the depth of the heat affected zone. We, we see that, you know, the, this uh, has moved. Uh, oops, <laughs> I'll have to get that back. But uh, that, that uh, anyway, uh, the, 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 the arrow moved and when I clicked on it, it disappeared. <laughs> the whole slide disappeared. But you can measure that depth, you know, going from here down to here very easily. So let's look at some problems with welds. Here's the lack of penetration. The uh, yellow uh, arrow here is pointing to the lack of penetration and the white's pointing to two different cracks. And then the red arrows are pointing to a uh, weld bead on each side. You notice there's only one on this side, but three on this side. Uh, so lack of penetration is the yellow arrow uh, on a section welded to a tube. Note the ID crack and the OD crack, white arrows, and the three passes on the left side, but only one on the right side for whatever reason. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know much about the, the history of these samples. Uh, just did metallography on them. Now here's hot cracking due to liquid metal embrittlement. And this can happen uh, when there's copper uh, involved in the process. This is a hot cracking of a steel plate during electron beam welding due to melting of the copper backup plate. They had this, this was sitting on a, a plate of copper and the welding process melted some of that plate and it went into the weld. And look at all the cracks here. And here, these are Vickers hardness indents that I did uh, on this process. But these are all uh, cracks and they're somewhat intergranular, the uh, direction that the, uh, the, as a crack is growing. So pretty uh, nasty looking. And here's a higher mag views of those cracks in that previous sample the liquid metal embrittlement. Over here, you can see uh, copper in the uh, grain boundaries, mostly prior austenite grain boundaries, of course, uh, because that's what's there when the uh, copper is molten. And it's, you know, it's gonna go in the, in the austenite grain boundaries, uh, prior austenite grain boundaries, not the ferrite grain boundaries, because 
and when the ferrite is forming, the copper is solidified. So, but you can see it very nicely. This is etched with nitol. This is 200x, this is 1,000x over here. <clears throat> and the major crack going through and then some tributaries over here. This is a stress relief crack example. And this is a, a Lehigh University restraint test specimen uh, that you can, you can read how to do it. And, uh, and it's very helpful in evaluating the effect of, of stress relieving on this plate steel. Uh, you can see there's a large crack running down here. Uh, this this is probably scale from the welding process, but this is the weld metal ends right here, and here's the end of the uh, the heat affected zone. There's some these are hardness readings that I made on there. Uh, over here at 200x, uh, you can see the, that the crack is intergranular as it, with that pattern. And this is the fusion line that you're that you're seeing. And that's a 200x. Here's hot tearing in a heat affected zone in a, a MIG metal and air gas welded HY80 steel plate. That's a little higher strength than the previous ones that you saw. Retch with nitol, and you can see this is the intergranular crack in here, and that's at a thousand x. I'm sorry, that's 500X because this is a smaller length of far, far than normal. It's half the normal width or length, I mean. Um, but you can clearly see that they, this is in the um, in the green boundaries, the cracking. And uh, lamellar tearing uh, is an interesting problem. It's, it's highly associated with higher inclusion content steels and uh, both sulfides and oxides can cause this. And you see that the tensile strength applied to this metal is running vertical with respect to the uh, rolling direction. So here's an area with uh, some inclusions where there's decohesion around the inclusion and some straining uh, in between uh, at the ends of the inclusions. And eventually they jo all join up and give you the lamellar tear. And uh, that has been a problem with uh, certain metals for quite a while. Uh, here's an example. Uh, Professor Dolby gave me this sample, this a micrograph, or no, I'm sorry, he gave me the, the sample and I did the micrograph. But you can see these cracks along here, uh, the lamellar tearing cracks on the left side. Uh, there's more more metal mass here. This is running uh, horizontal. This is running vertical. That's a, a corner of a carbon manganese steel joint. And there's a lot more penetration into the, the left side here than into the right side. Yeah, here's a more classic looking example of lamellar tearing structural steel. This is the hot rolling direction. And the, on this is the hot rolling direction is this way of the original uh, bars. Um, it has too much sulfur in this steel, which is leading to the, um, the, the lamellar tearing problem because too, too many manganese sulfides. And you can see uh, the two pieces of plate steel, uh, the, the surface of the weld metal here is uh, curved, hasn't been ground or anything. And uh, there's our crack running down through. And if we polish it and look at it, if, you know, you're gonna see all these sulfides running horizontally parallel to the hot rolling direction. Uh, here's an example of cold cracking. <clears throat> this is RQC 90 steel plate <clears throat> welded <clears throat> deliberately with a high hydrogen electrode. The specimen was an implant test specimen that was loaded to 193 megapascals or 28 KSI during weld solidification to test the sensitivity of the alloy to hydrogen induced cracking. So this is a deliberate test specimen to evaluate uh, this issue. How sensitive is it to hydrogen? And this is etched with nitol again. 
Um, but as you can see, uh, there's a crack, large uh, uh, void crack here, or maybe it's part of the shape of the weld. Um, and there's a crack running down here. There's cracks here. And this one definitely looks rather intergranular. Over here, uh, I opened up the, stamp, the broken sample, and this is, uh, this is 200X over here. This is 500X magnification. But you can see it's clearly intergranular. Here's another hydrogen induced crack uh, example. This is a macrostructure of hydrogen induced uh, root crack in a heat affected zone of a weld in an iron 0.2 carbon, 1.43 manganese, 0.15 silicon, 0.1015 niobium steel. This uh, it was given to me by Professor Dolby at the Welding Institute in the UK. And you can see the, the, the big crack right here. And uh, this is the, back, the maximum depth of penetration of the heat affected zone. But why, why isn't this, why aren't these two touching when they make this weld? This is gonna increase the stress on this weld metal because they're, 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 they've got this separation here. And you can see down here, the, the heat affected zone goes a bit deeper than up here, or it looks a little deeper. And you can see the fusion line here and over here. This is a crack. This is this looks like a crack right up in here, but it, you'd have to look at it uh, on the microscope to, microscope to make sure. Let's look at some microstructure of welds. <clears throat> and uh, with aluminum, we're going to use uh, Erica Vex 10 etch in the color uh, work with uh, um, 100 water, four grams potassium per manganate, and one gram of sodium hydroxide. We're going to immerse for up to 20 seconds. And of course, this the color etches always do a better job on cast structures than wrought samples because the microstructure is more exciting in a cast alloy than in a wrought alloy. Here's laser welded 5052 aluminum. And you can see this weld was not done very well. There's a big recess here at the corner. And that's going to concentrate the stresses. And on this end, you, you've got a big uh, bulge out the back. And look at that large oxide, uh, some kind of inclusion. And there's a couple smaller ones right here. Uh, but this undercut is uh, you know, not going to give you good properties. Uh, for, for the metal, and this is at 50X. Here's a, a laser welded 6061 aluminum sample. This is a little bit better, but you can see that this surface up here is not flat. And if you ground it to till it's flat, you're gonna go through, uh, you get down to here, you're gonna get through some of the, the plate steel or plate metal for the aluminum. This is laser weld in 6061. This is and this is the composition of 6061. It's a nominal composition. And uh, the VEX reagent does a nice job on it. And we're looking at this in polarized light with the sensitive pin plate in. And there's a couple of voids in here, right here and here, but they're not too serious. Here's a <clears throat> higher magnification views. Uh, uh, over here is uh, uh, 200x, this is 100x, and this is 100x. And again, this is etched with the VEX reagent for aluminum and viewed with polarized light and sensitive tint. Uh, here's the base metal. You can see the grains are somewhat horizontal. And the heat effect is zone in here. This is weld metal, and this is just weld metal. So, you know, you, you can learn a lot. Uh, and you can really see the structure of welds much better with color etching than black and white. Here's a friction stir weld in 2519 aluminum. And you can see deformation up here from the friction stir welding. And uh, this is the weld metal. This is the plate metal, uh, metal the original uh, microstructure. Not much of a heat affected zone, but uh, in this friction stir welding process, Here's the composition of the alloy, the nominal, and we're doing it with polarized light and the sensitive pin filler or plate uh, again. And that's 100X. 
Here's a friction star, another friction star weld. This is 7075 in the T651 uh, condition. And you can see that it's a beautiful pattern. And there are some large particles in here of uh, some kind of uh, non-metallic uh, phase. Uh, and it seems to be more present on this side than this side. But friction star welding gives you some really beautiful uh, microstructure patterns to look at. That's a uh, 50X magnification. Now, we, uh, Heinz Clem developed some really good color etchants. Uh, number one is very commonly used with a lot of uh, steels, cast iron. Um, it'll color beta phase in brass. Uh, you can use it for copper alloys, zinc, and its alloys. And it's uh, the stock solution. You just take uh, uh, spilled water and saturate it with sodium thiosulfate. Um, and you get, so we use 50 milliliters and one gram of potassium metabisulfite. And CLEMS 2 is five grams of potassium metabisulfite. And we can do alpha brass, tin, and uh, high manganese steels, like, you know, uh, Hadfield manganese steel. And this is the third, CLEMS number three. Again, the same, uh, well, it's a smaller amount of the stock solution. Uh, can, uh, and then it's diluted with water, and you add 20 grams of potassium um, for, um, for manganate. And uh, it uh, is useful with bronze and monel. Now, I want to show you a really interesting example here. And I, these pictures were done in the old days with Polaroid film. <laughs> Glued them together. Today, with today's technology electronically, you wouldn't have to get those those lines like that. But this was uh, the old days of film. And uh, this is a montage on a structure of a large weld and a carbon steel. Unfortunately, I didn't know what the welding process was uh, when I got the sample. As revealed using nitol, heat effect zone is larger uh, than usual. It goes, you know, from the fusion line up to uh, about it in here, and then it, the you can see these grains are somewhat elongated, but it's kind of hard to see the grain structure with nitro here. And here is the original base metal, and it looks like the grains are very small. But now, if we use a color etch, bango! Look at the difference. That huge difference. And you can really see the structure here fabulously. Look at that interface between the base metal and the heat affected zone. Chris, and this is the, the region where we're going to get these elongated grains, which, which is pretty common in uh, carbon steels. And then here we're, we're above the uh, upper critical temperature, and the grains are uh, equiaxed. And, and as we go towards the fusion line, they're getting coarser in size. So grain size and shape are dramatically changing from the fusion line to the base metal. This is viewed again in polarized light with a sensitive tin filter, filter plate. Um, this is a laser welded CDA-122 copper. We've got two sheets of it here, one on the top, one on the bottom. You can see the junction where the uh, between the two plates of this of this copper alloy, it's phosphorus deoxidized copper. We're using CLEMS number three, viewing in polarized light with sensitive tint, and the white arrows are pointing to two uh, pores in the weld, and uh, of course the black arrows I mentioned is the the junction between the two pieces of uh, uh, alloy that were welded. There's not a huge amount of penetration. Uh, into the bottom sample, but should be enough to keep it in place. And you can see, of course, the typical uh, surfaces uh, of the weld is going to be projected outward, like you've seen in all the other examples of similar kinds of shapes. But it's a pretty cool looking microstructure. Now, this is a copper 30% zinc explosively welded to a carbon steel. This is the cartridge brass. Here's the carbon steel. This is etched with nitol. This is CLEMS number one. And CLEMS number one will really darken 
the car, uh, the, the uh, carbon steel much, and that's it much faster. We want to see this part with uh, Clems. Uh, this won't be visible really. So you got to uh, do the two uh, etch times and then uh, take images and then glue them together electronically. But you can see there's some uh, deep defects in here on this edge. It's not real flat. And there's some voids in here, although they could be inclusions. Uh, you can't tell at this magnification, you have to look at it uh, as polished and uh, higher, uh, better magnification to know what it is. Uh, uh, Eric uh, Beck created a, an etchant for titanium, but in that original etchant, she used, claimed, uh, published 50 milliliters. But whenever I used it at 50 milliliters, I would always get artifacts. So I reduced, uh, I was talking to uh, Yanina Rajakuska at the Foundry Research Institute in Krakow, Poland, who uses such also. And uh, she told me she had the same problem. And she, she suggested lower the ethanol to 25 milliliters and it won't do that. Um, and she's right. I mean, it really worked uh, much better. Uh, there is HF in here in this compound, ammonium bifluoride. So uh, you don't want to get this on your hands. Uh, this is laser welded titanium six aluminum four vanadium, and Ti six four accounts for more than fifty percent of all titanium alloys sold in the world. This is laser welded, and uh, you can see the uh, longitudinal pattern here, and then the zone interface between the the base metal and the or excuse me, the weld metal and the original alloy. Again, we're looking at it in a polarized light with the sensitive tint filter. Here's a, another example of uh, laser welded CP tie. Uh, this is ASTM F67. Unfortunately, the grade number is grade one, but it's covered up on the top here, but you can see it in the text. So you can see that these are not lined up extremely well. And uh, I don't know why they weren't, but they weren't. But uh, two sheets commercial purity titanium, uh, ASTM F67, grade one, viewed as polished on the left and after etching with modified VEX reagent on the right and viewing with polarized light, but without the sensitive tint filter. We didn't really need to use the sensitive tint uh, filter because that, that, its purpose is to increase the color contrast in the grains, but we got lots of, of color just uh, uh, with the polar cross polarized light. <clears throat> you can see a big pore here. <clears throat> Looks like there's a, a pore, pore here. This may or may not be a pore. It doesn't quite look like a pore, but we'd have to look at it as polished, like over here. Here you can see a void. Now, uh, you get, this is, you can see the orientation here. This is the reversed orientation of the over here. And I believe this is the backside of this sample. But uh, it was too long ago to remember, remember for sure. It might just be uh, upside down compared to the one on the left. Now, here's a, a, a silver cadmium welded to copper. The cadmium alloy is on the left side here. And uh, this is uh, the the fusion line here, and we've got a heat affected zone here. And in the Namarsky differential interference contrast will reveal the height differences of, of, of the surfaces very well. And if you looked at this sample on the left in bright field, you wouldn't see uh, anywhere near this amount of information. And this part uh, you can see is the uh, copper alloy um, and uh, it's got a nice twin microstructure and over here actually you can see it beautifully. And then there's this, this fusion line zone with a uh, different color here, but this is the actual interface between, uh, which is right over here. So uh, the, the microstructure is being affected 
uh, by this welding process and and probably also diffusion of the silver cadmium into the area in the welding process. Need to do microprobe work on that. Uh, this is an as welded 1006 or 1006 carbon steel, uh, which here's the composition. It's less than 0.08 carbon and, um, and typical mi middle range is 0.3 manganese. And there's, of course, there's some silicon added. Uh, and I don't know whether this was aluminum killed or not, but because I, I never chemically analyzed it. But this is a nitol on the left, and this is CLEMS 1 on the right. And you can see each one is revealing different aspects of the microstructure. And the, the color etch is revealing the columnar shape grains in the heat affected zone here. It, there's a little bit of elongation there. But over here, you don't even see them. But you are seeing a lot of perlite in the heat affected zone uh, uh, because it's going to solution and re precipitating. And, uh, but you don't, you can't see that over here. And the base metal, you can see the grain structure nice here. It's very fine grain, but you can't see the grain structure of the ferrite over here at all uh, with uh, the night tall. I mean, uh, you, you'd have to etch it more heavily and uh, then you might see it, but then this area would be over etched. So the carbon rich regions in the heat affected zone are revealed better by nitrile. It's uh, the reprecipitation of the carbon that was in solution in this zone here. And uh, over here, you can't really see that because it's etching the ferrite so strongly, you don't really see the, the other constituents. And we're only at 50X on the right. If you went up to a, a 500X, you, you might be able to see some of the, the perlite patches. And here's uh, the same sample, but just with uh, nitol. And this is the weld metal. And you can see it's a bit uh, acicular in appearance, not totally. And there's some patches here. Those, those look like they're inclusions, and, but it is acicular. Now here's the heat affected zone, and you got the precipitation of these large patches of perlite here. And over here on the right, this is the base metal with the unaffected uh, microstructure, uh, nice ferrite grains, reasonably equiax, but not perfect. And uh, you can see some perlite in here. So, uh, first, you know, when you put the, all, the, all the heat, you're dissolving all the carbon and the structure when it transforms is gonna look much different than in the base metal uh, away from the the temperature there was below the AC1 of the alloy. And here's two more examples of this sample. It's a microstructure of the weld metal on the left, the base metal on the right, uh, using CLEMS-1. Massive cementite particles can be seen in the base metal on the right. Uh, see the white patches right, right in here and in here, here. And of course, ferric grains can be white the wide range of colors depending on the crystal uh, orientation. If you have preferred crystallographic texture, you get a very narrow range of colors in the grains because they're all in the same, pretty much in the, all in the same uh, orientation. But when you have a random orientation of the crystal structure, then you get a wide range of colors. So you can always use CLEMS reagent to detect whether the steel has preferred orientation or not when you're working with it, whether it's randomly oriented. But you can't do that with nitol. Here's a, a carbon steel weld etched with CLEMS-1. And uh, this is the base metal back here and the weld metal is down here. And uh, I don't know the grade of steel in this sample, but it's a, it is a carbon steel. And there, when you look at the range structure from here going inward, you can see a wide range of grain sizes until we get into the base metal, which is very fine grain and looks reasonably equiax, but it's not that way out here. And you can see uh, the effects along the fusion line uh, are a bit variable. We've got some 
of changes of microstructures uh, here, but not everywhere. <clears throat> so color etching really has a tremendous value in doing this work. Now, uh, Baraha, uh, I often say Baraha haha, uh, develops some uh, sulfamic acid reagents, which are quite interesting to use. And uh, the uh, reagent number, they're number one to four. I often refer to them as B1, B2, B3, B4. Um, and they're all 100 milliliters of water and then various amounts of grams here of potassium metabisulfite. And this is the sulfonic uh, uh, acid. And this is ammonium bifluoride. And you see only the number four has a small addition, which inc this really improves the etching of the higher alloy grades, like martensitic stainless steels, tool, some, some tool steels. Some tool steels are very simple to, in, in composition and easy to etch, but others are much more difficult because they cover a wide range of alloy contents. And the manganese steel is mainly talking about uh, like Hatfield manganese steel. <clears throat> now this is a ship steel, AH36 as welded. And uh, I don't know what the welding process was. Oh, no, I do. Flux core arc weld, gas assisted. And this is etched with Baraha's uh, sulfamic number three, reviewing it in polarized light and sensitive tint. And the green, the red arrows here are pointing to the fusion line. And you can see the heat affected zone coming out. And this is base metal down here. But this is the edge of the fusion line. So, uh, of course, the heat affected zone is going to be less depth here than below it because of, you know, the, the heat can't escape as fast over here as it can escape over here. And you can see a little white line along here. It looks like there's some kind of a second phase there. Maybe maybe it's all ferrite from uh, decarbonization. But uh, it's very interesting microstructure. And you see the range here of the in the solidification pattern in the weld metal. And uh, here's a spot weld in deep drawing sheet steel. <clears throat> and the uh, center of the weld is up here. <clears throat> and uh, here's the heat affected zone. And the base metal is here and right along in here. So this is deep drawing quality, carbon manganese uh, sheet steel. We're using CLEMS-1 polarized light and sensitive tint. But you can, it really enables you to see the structure beautifully. And, and black and nitol, you're, you wouldn't see any near, anywhere near this degree of information. But you can see the solidification pattern in the weld and the, and the edge of the of the heat effect zone is very clearly visible. Uh, this is a weld of a uh, uh, deep drawing quality sheet steel uh, spot weld, but we're only in the spot weld, and the center of the spot weld is right up in here somewhere. And but you can see this pattern and this uh, acicular uh, st structure uh, is very interesting. With, uh, and that's probably all due to the stresses in a spot weld. Uh, but I haven't seen any, too many people study these kind of effects. Here's a, a very interesting spot weld with the solidification pattern. The center of the spot weld is right over here. <clears throat> this is a 350 megapascal HSLA high strength low alloy sheet steel uh, revealed with the Baraha sulfonic acid reagent. And you can see the, the solidification pattern beautifully, the direction of the solidification. And you, you'd never see that detail with nitol. And here's an example of a gas tungsten arc welded sample of trimrite, martensitic stainless steel. And here's the composition of the trimrite. It's, uh, this is actual composition, I believe. Point, uh, it could be not, I think maybe it's nominal. 0.23 carbon, 14.25 chrome, 0.65 nickel, and 0.7% molybdenum. And it was post heat treated after the welding process at uh, using this temperature. It's a double anneal, 843 centigrade and then air cooled, and then reheated to 788 centigrade and air cooled. 
And this was etched with uh, Raha, or excuse me, Vilela, Jose Ramon Vilela from Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and note the heat of, uh, treatment has refined the weld structure quite a bit. And the heat effect zone is hard to see now. Uh, and, and of course, if we go to color, you can see this easier than you could you know, with the Vilela's, but uh, uh, still not perfect, but you can see the fusion line beautifully here and the orientation inside the, the heat effect zone. And this is the center of the weld. So very interesting structure. That's uh, again, 50X. Here's a butt weld in 439 foot stainless steel. You can see the junction between the two pieces of uh, Furtick stainless steel right here. And when they butt welded it, um, that's with Baraja sulfamicry number four. And because uh, 439 has a fair alloy content, you really got to go to number four, but which of course this is stainless steel and uh, Furtick stainless steels can have more alloy content than some Martin silicate grade because it usually has more chromium. And that's 50X uh, uh, in the view here. And uh, th this is bright field view, and this is polarized light and sensitive tint. And a bright field view gives you good uh, information. So I always would start when, when I'm doing color etching here, I always start in bright field and see what I can learn. And then I, tr I go to polarized light and sensitive tint and in some cases, I'll just back off slightly from the cro full, fully cross position to get a little better light intensity. But you can see that both of them are very helpful and better to have both than none. When you're trying to understand what's going on here. Here's a 7MO plus, uh, that's a carpenter alloy, uh, duplex stainless steel, uh, welded with uh, 2213 and it's, I can't read it because it's behind the sign here, but uh, uh, I think it's 20, I think it's 2235 uh, Nitronic 50 is the, is the, uh, the alloy. Uh, this is the weld, and here's the original plate steel. You can see the delta ferrite in this alloy, because this is a duplex stainless steel, it's hot rolled, and you can, and uh, I don't know if it was cold rolled as well, but it was definitely hot rolled. You can see in this area, the uh, delta ferrite is all horizontal and closely together, highly elongated because of the deformation. And then when we do the welding, the delta ferrite in this area is going in solution and then re-precipitating on cooling. And here's the weld metal. Um, with Barajas B1, and bright field illumination. So it says ferrite's colored, but the alternate is unaffected. So this, but this is delta ferrite here, I'm sure. That, that's not, uh, the, the ferrite in the, in the alloy uh, that is not elongated is, is visible. But uh, yeah, this, yeah, this would, this would be austenite actually in, in this duplex alloy because the white or the colored phase, that is definitely the ferrite. And that's in, in between uh, the elongated grains of the austenite. And that's my last picture. So I hope uh, everybody uh, has enjoyed the examples and gotten some uh, interesting ideas out of the presentation which uh, I, I hope is helpful for you. Yeah, George, I mean, I must thank you for your nice description about, you know, the microstructure, macrostructure of, uh, you know, the different welded samples, you know, different welding process and different materials and all. And I, I can see from the participants list that there, there are a large number of, you know, the doctoral scholars uh, who are working in the field of uh, the welding are present. And I'm pretty sure that there must be some questions. Uh, in so Good. If, uh, are you are you going to be taking questions from them? 
Yeah, uh, so I participants, if you have got any questions, you can place it uh, quickly in the chat box. Yeah, all majority of the doctoral scholars I can see. So uh, there must be some questions from. Uh, I can try to answer them and then you might be able to answer a few uh, other questions depending on what the nature of the question is. Yeah, so if, uh, uh, as of now, there is no questions typed uh, in the chat box. So I'm requesting the scholars quickly place your questions in the chat box. Good. <clears throat> Well, so far we haven't. Yeah, uh, it hasn't started snowing badly here. Yeah, so but you know, the just uh, uh, maybe the same questions, uh, you know, the would be there in the minds of the scholars. You have you shown one of the examples like the depth of penetration uh, in a in yeah. pea samples and all. So for, uh, somewhere we have found that the the penetration is much higher as compared to the other plane. Is there any specific reason for that? I don't know. I'd have to know more about the welding process and maybe look at the microstructure to be able to have any idea. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the one question uh, is from Mr. G. Prasant. Uh, in resistance spot welding, what are the general defects? Uh, that's a question placed by. In res resistance spot welding? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. You can get some pores, but that's not too common. Um, the, the spot welding is best done on lower alloy materials than higher alloy materials. I mean, I mean, it can where you can have phase transformations. Then maybe the yeah. metal embrittlement, uh, embrittlement as well, LME defects and all hot packing. Yeah, right. Small sense. But in general, spot welding when done with the right uh, alloys uh, works very well and uh, and it gives you decent properties. Yeah. Yeah. So, how to edge friction star welded sample for steel and aluminium dissimilar joints? Question placed by Santanu Da. How to do what? How to edge friction star welded sample for steel and aluminium dissimilar material? Uh, are they is How, steel being welded to aluminum? Yeah. Or are you talk. Uh, you'd have to you'd have to etch uh, the two different portions with a the best etch for each, and uh, look at the side that you're etching with the correct etching because the other side's not going to be helpful. You know. You'd have to do that in two steps. That, that's that's more challenging when you have such vast differences in composition and uh, corrosion resistance and so forth. The next question is of the same type. Uh, the if the aluminium and copper uh, have you know the joint together, how to edge uh, to to see the microstructure clearly? This is a question placed by Rishaw. And uh, the answer you have already made it for uh, the previous questions, like uh, yeah. Well, I always start off when I have uh, two different, uh, widely different alloys being etched or welded together, and I want to etch them. I always start off with the best etch for each uh, alloy, uh, and see what I can learn, because there's is rarely ever one etchant that exists. That will etch both sides very well because of the you know the corrosion resistance difference and so forth. That that that's a challenging process. There is no other question I but, can see at this moment. Anyway, uh, the uh, George, I must thank you for the very beautiful uh, you know the presentation. Uh, all the slides are really wonderful. 
you've clearly shown us the various defects uh, that that we generally uh, see for you know during welding of the different materials uh, by using the different process as well and uh, the students will uh, I, i'm pretty sure they have enjoyed your you know uh, thank you yeah thank you take so care yeah thank you so much for taking all the pain uh, you know at the very first day of the new year uh, to be with us uh, for this uh, you know webinar series and uh, you know it's really wonderful thank you so much that's my pleasure i request ananta please do let us know the speakers for the next yeah thank you george once again what what, what did you say there yeah it's it's a, uh, you know the uh, the upcoming seminars uh, the next oh. uh, would be uh, on the uh, industry 4.0 in the steel making process uh -huh. by ah. this, you know the sanjeev ko and then uh, there would be another uh, the real time process monitoring online monitoring of the machining process by using the vibration sensors and all and other type of sensors by being shoot go from the university of harris in the uk good the next yeah and then from the university of nottingham draggers uh, would be talking about the time dependent and factory mm -hmm. why the inverse problems need to be solved and then on uh, the the last saturday of january uh, swaminathan gopal is i mean would be talking about the uh, health monitoring for cyber physical system uh -huh. uh, so means from the texas am we are also uh -huh. organizing the uh, the uh training program six day training program uh, on industrial robotics january 17 to january 22nd our registration date uh, would be the uh, closing very soon so if someone of you is interested it's uh, you can quickly register for that only few seats are left last date of for registration is the 15th now on these programs are they only advertised to the your students or to uh non students get the messages we, we 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 sent emails to all the iits uh, mechanical engineering department and then some other allied departments yeah uh, all iit faculty members so that means 23 iits are there at this moment in, in india and we are circulating emails not only in iit we are also sending emails to nit and our alumni uh, we are putting in the best mm -hmm. Uh, in the linkedin of i indian institute of technology kharagpur and uh, we uh -huh. are circulating our this uh, the advertisement uh, to various industries and uh, the, the oh good the, you know the do you, do you know how many people were watching yeah right now the uh, today the number is a bit less uh, around 25 right now the 20 22 you know the people are present but uh, we since it is getting recorded uh, so uh, you know the people do watch uh, later on uh, the series uh, because these are all in youtube and uh, good yeah so the past webinars previous webinars anyone can see by uh, scanning this code with this i mm -hmm. like to uh, close today's uh, you know the session once again happy new year to everybody thank you so much